My name is Tanya Fincham, along with Alex Bishop. We're with Oklahoma State University, and today we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to speak with Robert Thomas, right? Robert Thomas? Robert Thomas. Thomas. Thank you for having us today. Let's start with having you tell us when and where you were born. I was born in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, a suburb of Akron, and I was born July 28th, 1914, the day that Austria declared war on Serbia, starting First World War. And what did your parents do for a living? My father was an accountant with Firestone Tire and Rubber. And your mother? Well, she was a housewife. Okay. And did you have brothers and sisters? I had a younger brother and a sister who is still alive, 12 years younger than I am. Okay. Did you live in town or out in the country? No, we lived in town. Okay. And where did you go to school? I went to public schools in Cuyahoga Falls. Um, And after working two years following high school, I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, the Wharton School of Finance. Why there? What? Why? Why did you decide to go there? Oh. <laughs> Well, in my two years of between high school and college, um, I worked for a short while with Firestone, and my duties took me into the uh, so-called Mahogany Row, which was the offices of vice presidents and the president, who was John Thomas, a relative of my father, and Harvey Firestone, the chairman, and I told my father one day that wherever I went, I wanted to be in Mahogany Row, but not at Firestone, for the reason that John Thomas had a Hello. son Robert D, and yeah. I was Robert E, and one payday, I got his check and he got mine, <laughs> and I learned that being the son of John Thomas was worth a lot more than being the son of Talbot Thomas. A pretty important lesson, I guess, huh? <laughs> That's right. And I was accepted for the Warden School. Um, I um, was already a trained accountant and 
I went to three hour exams as a freshman and walk out in no more than 45 minutes and my I was able to graduate in three years. Uh, my marks were such that I had unlimited cut privileges my last two years and I was exempt from all final exams in my last two years. So I went through the four-year course in three. Pretty impressive. Did it take a lot of studying? Not, not a great deal. I was doing some work for my uncle's companies in my last two years and one of the things I negotiated was the sale of one of the companies to Armstrong Corp. And a very profitable sale for my uncle. Uh, and uh, it resulted in Armstrong Corp talking to me about coming there following graduation. And I never heard of them in a letter. Uh, I had told them that I'd be available on June 15th because I had no final exams to take and so I went to work for Keystone Custodian Funds the 1st of June in large part because they met my salary requirements. Um, in 1936, the going salary for a college graduate was 125 a month. A month. And I thought with all of my experience, I wanted a minimum of 200 a month. And Keystone Custodian Funds met it, and I went there as assistant general manager. And the first year, I actually earned over 300 a month. Uh, but the night of June 15th, when I arrived home, I had a call from the Vice President of Armstrong Corp. How, how come I didn't show up that morning? And I said, well, I didn't show up because I never received any sort of a letter. And I uh, was tendered this job offer where they met my requirements and the uh, one of my professors was particularly interested in Keystone Custodian Funds and he urged me to go there uh, he was one of my professors, Canby Balderston, who later on became assistant uh, or 
vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and I used to go to see him in Washington. He was a professor that was very dry and typically fellows would get sleepy and they just brought lectures and one day one of my classmates fell asleep and Canby said, wake him up. And the fellow next to him said, you wake him up, you put him to sleep. <laughs> well, I, I stayed with the Keystone until No, thank you. Well, the war ended and Keystone had a hundred and twenty five million invested in railroad securities that were only worth about ninety. And that was viewed as a very serious problem. And I was dumped into the job of doing something about it. Well, in the process, I became known in New York, Wall Street, as the leading financial expert on railroad finance. And when an executive of Penn Road Corporation died, which was formerly a railroad holding company of Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, they still had about a half a dozen major railroad investments that were viewed as a serious problem and they came after me. That's when I went to New York and I went to New York as the vice president. Um, Well, it was in 1955 that a fellow named, a banker named Ed Clawton in Florida died and to the astonishment of people with his estate, he owned 75% of the common stock of the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad. In Hop, had over a hundred brokerage accounts across the country. He never reported it to the SEC. He didn't believe in that. And anyway, Cy Lewis, a senior partner of Bear Stearns, got the job of finding a buyer. The first person they came to was me. And I ended up, along with a partner from Boston, buying the 75% and so uh, my initial demand to the president, Don Fraser, was I wanted four board seats out of 21 
and I expected to be named chairman. Um, well, they, I asked him to come to New York for dinner to talk about this, and he said he couldn't get there by railroad when I wanted him. Well, I said, Don, have you ever heard of TWA? <laughs> He'd never been on an airplane. <laughs> well, I got him on a plane, and anyway, he came to have dinner with me, and they had to arrange their board, of course, uh, to get four resignations out of 21. And they had a board meeting in Houston where they accepted the resignations and elected four directors, including me, and Bill Warren of Warren Petroleum, and who is the donor of St. Francis Hospital here. He made the motion to elect me chairman. And so I proceeded to run the railroad. <laughs> I was 41 years old. And I uh, decided I needed some help after a year or two, and I succeeded in hiring another railroad president who was a year younger than I, and together we began to really overhaul things. And we had offices in five separate cities, ones outside of Houston, where we were tied up in the courts for over a year before we moved it to Denison, Texas. And Dallas, we moved to Denison, okay and Parsons, Kansas. We had half of the equipment on the train and half on the station platform. When we were stopped by union action in the courts and that wasn't a uh, big problem because IBM provided the equipment that we were missing. And Bill, uh, Bill Duran was my young president a year younger. And I would talk practically every night in the week. And I lived in New York, and he lived in Kansas City. Well, we decided when they tied us up in knots in Parsons, St. Louis was scheduled to go two weeks later and we decided we'd move 
St. Louis one week later, and we did it on a Saturday night. We moved in 20 moving vans around dinner time. By four o'clock, every van was loaded and successfully on its way to Denison, going east to Illinois and not through Missouri. And, well, Monday morning all hell broke loose because the employees arrived to a notice that everything had been moved and a special train would depart Tuesday afternoon at 5 p.m. to take employees who wanted to go to Denison and living accommodations would be provided. Well, some went and some didn't, but the first thing that happened, we were tossed out of the Chamber of Commerce. When Bill told me that, I said, wonderful. That's going to save us about 25000 a year. And then the St. Louis Globe Democrat, the newspaper, wrote an editorial in which they termed Bill a bad apple and termed Bob Thomas the master criminal mind from New York. And then it was rumored that Senator Magnuson from Oregon was going to have a investigation in Washington and I got on the telephone. I was doing a lot of drilling in West Texas personally for tax reasons and I called Ed Conley, the drilling operator, who also happened to be the chairman of the Democratic Party in Texas. And I said, Ed, I need to get to know Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, and Lyndon Johnson, the Majority Leader in the Senate, in a hurry. Well, three days later, I was in Washington and my first visit was with Sam Rayburn in the speaker's office. And when I was done talking to him, they took me into the bowels of the, of the Capitol building where Lyndon Johnson had one of his several offices. And when I walked into this office, he was sitting there with his feet up on the desk. <laughs> and he greeted me not with any smiles or anything else, but he seated me down in the corner opposite to his chair and 15 or 20 minutes went by and 
He hadn't smiled, he hadn't said anything. And I thought, Thomas, you got to keep talking. And a few minutes later, he smiled. He asked me some questions. And the meeting was over. He walked me out through the reception room. On my right side, he was slightly taller, with his left arm over my shoulder. And when we got in the reception room and I was about to leave the office, he said, Bob, don't worry about us. Sam and I will straighten it out. And ten days in New York, in Washington, and I saw one or the other every business day. And the final day, just Sam Reverend and Lyndon Johnson together in the speaker's office and they explained to me what I had to do to satisfy everybody and I assured them that it would be done and it was and then Ed Conley told me that I should figure out some way to thank Sam Reverend especially. And the way we thanked him, his birthday was roughly the same as the opening of Congress in January. And we began yearly at the Mayflower Hotel. We'd give a dinner, cocktails, dinner, orchestra, dancing. We'd invite all the Texas congressmen and their wives the two senators and their wives, and the governor. And we did that every year until Sam died. And I got to know him very well. Um, in later years, I addressed him as Mr. Sam. And, you know, the, when he died, I provided my private car to take Harry Truman and Bess to the funeral. And when it was over, I went aboard to be sure that they were being taken care of, and they were. They were drinking our bourbon, <laughs> and I had a bourbon with them. <laughs> well... All of these politicians, did you ever have any political aspirations yourself, like running for Senate, President? I have been asked to but I turned them down. Um, when Reagan, about the time Reagan was running for president, I was asked if I would consider running for president. And 
my then about to be wife heard this conversation in our airplane on a trip and she told me when we got on the ground if I had any idea about doing that, I could forget all about getting married. <laughs> so that killed that. <laughs> she chose marriage over politics. <laughs> and I've been asked to run for Senate and so forth in Oklahoma, but I never really had any desire to be a senator or be president or anything like that. Uh, I was satisfied with being president of MAPCO and you know I got this idea of the pipeline system which became the basis of MAPCO uh, when I had lunch one day in New York in 57 with the chairman of the Missouri Pacific Railroad, he told me about this pipeline project that Missouri Pacific and New York Central um, were debating and he said the Missouri Pacific is going to do nothing with it because the traffic department is opposed. They don't want to lose the tank car traffic. And he said if you're interested you're welcome to the idea. I went back to the office and I called Bill Warren and I asked him if he thought I'd be wasting my time to spend any time looking at this project. Well, he didn't. And then I called Al Perlman, the president of the New York Central, and I saw him 8 o'clock the next morning. Now, I'd known Al very well. He was executive VP of the Denver Wire Clan when I knew him. And he was approached about the New York Central job. And I had dinner with Al and his wife in Denver to talk about whether he ought to consider it. So I knew him very well. And when I told him about my conversation with the Missouri Pacific chairman and the fact that they handed me the project, he was delighted because he knew the Missouri Pacific wasn't going to move on it. And anyway, 
The next thing I did, I called John Williams, who I didn't know. They were the pipeline contractor that was involved in this whole project. And, well, John was delighted that someone with real interest would take it over. And we took it over, and three years later, we were successful in we had raised 72 million. Uh, 42 million we borrowed from the Prudential, and 30 million we sold public securities. And we came out of construction with 6 million in cash because. I had a reserve fund of three million in the budget. And one of the investment bankers couldn't believe that. And so to shut him up, I raised another three million. And we came out of construction with six million in cash. And we began to expand right away. Uh, and we were successful in everything that we undertook and we grew up to be a Fortune 500 company in less than 10 years. What did MAPCO stand for? Mid-America Pipeline Company. Is that what brought you to Tulsa then? That's right. Um, at that time, as chairman of the railroad, I, I lived in New York. I had an office in New York office in Dallas and an office initially in St. Louis. Um, when the pipeline was successful, uh, I moved, decided, since most of our shippers were here in Oklahoma, that Tulsa would be the place to put the headquarters. And July 1st, 1960, I moved to Tulsa. And By train? No. By plane. <laughs> <laughs> well, we grew very rapidly and we were highly successful. We uh, expanded in among other things, into the coal business. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, hmm. Our investment banker got the job of finding a buyer for a coal mine in Kentucky that was owned by several individuals. The major owner had had a heart problem and he became very concerned 
because he suddenly realized that if he died, his partners could buy him out at book value. Well, the book value was minimal because he charged off everything but the kitchen sink and therefore the book value if he died would cost his estate millions. And we bought him out for $12 million in MAPCO stock. And it was a non-union mine. Uh, it had a profit sharing plan. And one of the interesting things that happened, shortly after we bought it, we had a profit sharing plan dinner for the miners and their wives. And I went to this dinner loaded with slides of one sort or another and described what kind of a company MAPCO was. And at one point, I was telling about employees with their service pins, and I said to our young fellow, our treasurer, Dean, Stand up and show them your service pin. He stood up and he said, I'm sorry, Bob, I must have left it on my pajamas. <laughs> that brought the house down. <laughs> and, well, we, uh, we were able to make a success in the coal business because we were non-union. We expected a day's work for a day's pay. And our miners typically would make thirty to thirty five dollars a man day as compared to a union miner when they worked making twenty or twenty two mm. and we expanded very rapidly in the goal business and we were we were able to pay those wages because we got a man days of work for a man days of pay. And our miners were producing, oh, 25 to 30 tons of coal a day as compared to a union mine that maybe had 15, 18 tons a man day. Well, you, you talked uh, um, in terms of your success, who, who was a mentor? Who can you, Was there anybody in your life that kind of inspired you or was a mentor to you to be successful? Well, I just had a desire to be su successful and that's all there was to it. And you talked about your, I think, uncle earlier. Was it Uncle Ray? 
Yes. How how was he? Was he kind of a, a an early motivator or? Absolutely. Uh, first place, he had two sons. The older son died of a strep throat in the mid twenties. Uh, my uncle had the same doctor in Philadelphia for his son that took care of Coolidge's son when he died of a strep throat. And his other son, his younger son, was sort of, well, he, my uncle didn't think as much of him as he thought of his older son. And when I went to the Wharton School, I lived with my uncle and I had Dick's room and he sort of treated me as an older son. Was this your mother's? Mother's uh, brother. Mother's brother. Uh, was he a businessman too? Oh and yes. What, what kind of companies did he run? He was a road builder and companies related to road building materials. And he was also a yachtsman. He taught me navigation and I uh, No, when the war broke out, I tried to get a commission in the Navy. Based upon my navigation and other experiences, I was turned down because I was told I was worth more as a taxpayer. Jeannie's father was turned down for the same reason. <laughs> Pays to be smart. <laughs> so did you ever get a check that was bigger than Robert D's? Robert E's? Is that right? Robert E's? You're a, Thomas? Your middle initials E? Yes. So you wanted a bigger check than Robert D's? Dear Robert D. D. So did you succeed at that? Oh, yes. <laughs> and did you get your mahogany row? Well, I had a very fancy office here in Tulsa. And yes. <laughs> Now, did you ever get to meet, was it uh, Mr. Firestone? I did. Mm -hmm. And what was your impression of him when you met him? Oh, he was, he would walk around the plants and he'd go to the cafeteria for lunch and things like that. And he, had a huge estate in Akron. And Robert D., the son of John W., uh, well, he became 
president of Firestone years later. And of course, Firestone has gone by the boards. And I think it's owned by a Japanese company now. Now, I understand that you were you had a influential role in the, the American Red Cross in Oklahoma. Well, I raised the money for the new building out by the airport. You're here in Tulsa? Yes. They worked on me for three years <laughs> and I turned them down and the third year, in a weak moment, I agreed to walk through the building on Harvard, which was around 35th Street. And I walked through it, and when it was over, I said, if this was a MAPCO facility, I'd have it torn down. <laughs> well, I laid down the terms under which I would agree to raise the dough. And I I had, I insisted that I could decide the location, the cost, the design, everything connected with the building. And I was able to put a committee together that we set out to raise the six and a half million. That was in the late 70s. Um, and we started out talking to various foundations for the real money. And when we had raised about three and a half million, we had a dinner, black tie dinner in Tulsa. And we announced that we'd raised this three and a half million as I remember, and that we expected to go on and raise the rest of the money and build a new building. And we're very proud of that building. They uh, elected me chairman for a couple of years, and then they elected me chairman emeritus, which I am to this day. <laughs> and we have an outstanding building. It's one of the best Red Cross headquarters buildings in the country, mm. without question. You did a good job. <laughs> well, uh, all it takes is money. <laughs> Not always. And you got to have a little bit of willpower. <laughs> You've had a lot of successes. Were there any ventures that you didn't succeed at? Really? 
है Good question. <laughs> you don't need to forget think of one. That's wonderful. Now, relative to today, did, did you ever think you'd make it to 100 years of age? Well, I sort of had the objective. And as I got closer, uh, it became more apparent that I was going to make it. And what do you contribute your longevity to? What's your secret? <laughs> I've I've said two martinis every night before dinner, <laughs> in sort of a joking way, but... Are those dirty martinis? No. Okay. <laughs> and when I was 40 or 45, I'd think nothing of two or three double martinis before dinner, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> we first met at each other in 1957, hmm. and we've both been married before. Uh, it was Oh seven that we were together for a Sunday night dinner party in November oh seven and in October oh seven I had purchased this apartment because I've been in bed with a terrible cold and my doctor said, Bob, I think it's time for you to go to Monterey. Well, I hung up the phone, I called Monterey and they told me this apartment, penthouse apartment, was going to be available, and I said, put my name on it, I'll send you a $50,000 deposit this morning. Without looking. <laughs> and then in November, we were seated together at this dinner, and Monday morning, it was a Sunday night. Monday morning, I called Jeannie to have dinner with me Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday because I was driving to my winter home in California Thursday. She turned me down. <laughs> and I began to pester her on the telephone Nightly, December 4th of Friday, Williams sent a jet to pick me up because I was testifying in a very important legal case where I was the only living witness who knew all the characters. Well, I flew back and I had dinner dates four nights in a row with the Dean. And 
Then I told Williams that they didn't mind flying me back two or three days later, I'd stay a little longer. The ice storm came. And her house was cold. Her daughter's house was cold. My house was nice and warm. <laughs> and I kidnapped her. <laughs> and we had lots of time to talk. And I tried to convince Jeannie. The ice storm was going on. Why didn't she fly to California with me and where it was nice and warm? And she finally did. And we stayed until after New Year's, because we had both had friends out there. And when we returned, we had dinner with our daughter and son-in-law. And after the grandkids had disappeared, I told them we had loads of time to talk, and we had decided to get married. Well, we were married in March, and I hadn't seen the apartment yet. <laughs> I was paying for it, but we finally decided We'd better take a look and then at our relative ages, possibly we should move in. And we began to upgrade it with her decorator and finally moved in in August. Oh, Eight, and we sold her house and we gave my house to Trinity Episcopal Church for the home for the rector and his wife. And we We did a major job overhauling the place and I think we've been very happy here. It's home. Yeah. Home now. Yes. Uh, spe speaking of church, how, how important has religion or church been in, in your life? Well, I've been a vestryman in the Episcopal Church in the East. When I came to Tulsa, I was on a committee of St. John's as a result of the rector in the East writing to the rector here. Um, I I think church is relatively important. Did you get, ever get invited to the White House? No. Were you invited to the White House? Oh yes, several times. Really? Yes, I have a picture in my office of Ford and I shaking hands with a martini in the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I was at the White House a number of times with the Reagan. Um, you know, Nancy redid the White House. It was in terrible shape. Uh, the, some of the rooms had drapes that were raggedy, paint peeling, and the, uh, a lot was done and contributors were invited to a White House dinner where we were taken to the top floor in the elevator uh, when we arrived and then walked down at our leisure. Uh, the, I was never invited by Lyndon to the White House. Um, but obviously not Truman. My one episode with the Trumans was the Sam Rayburn funeral and going aboard to have a bourbon with the Germans. Well, when you traveled, did you do it mostly by train? When I was on the railroad, I traveled in my private car, which had a sitting room, dining room, galley, Two, three bedrooms. When did you give that up? Well, I gave that up when I resigned as chairman. And when when was that? That was in '65. A while ago. Okay. So I want to know today at a hundred, what's a typical day like for you? What time do you get up? What what sort of things do you do during the day? And what, what's a typical day like in the life? Of, uh, well, it's not a stressful day. <laughs> I have an office, um, the 45th floor of the Williams Building. Uh, I'm a lifetime consultant to the Williams companies. Uh, I uh, typically uh, drill for oil and gas. Sometimes more active than others. At the moment, it's sort of quiet because the area we've been developing in Kansas is pretty well developed now. And we're looking for new worlds to conquer. How many, so you, you still go to work during the week? Oh, yes. How many hours uh, would you say you work or during the week? Oh, two or three days, maybe four. And taxes require a lot of attention.
you still do some of the financial work and accounting work? Oh, not exactly. I prepare my taxes and then I have an assistant that does a lot of work for me. She's a very capable gal. So very impressive. <laughs> well, and wh how do you spend your time when you're here? Do you do much reading or watch television or what? Oh, um, I watch TV some and do quite a bit of reading. Um, financial magazines more than anything. Mm -hmm. Staying up with the stock market? Well, I worry about stocks. Mm -hmm. I have quite a few. And you were telling us earlier, you still drive. Oh, yeah. You still drive. Um, some people are surprised at that. Jeannie thinks I'm one of the best drivers she's ever known. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Good. And today, do you, do you think, when you look on your life, do you have a philosophy or a motto that you live by? No. Do you have any, anything on your bucket list, something you still want to do that you haven't done yet? Well, there are a couple of places I'd love to go. One is the Taj Mahal, and the other is the Great Wall in China. Jeannie's been to both of them. She's been around the world a couple of times. <laughs> and, and I uh, I have too much of a problem with travel today. Uh, so the Taj Mahal is impossible, and the Great Wall in China. Um, I just have too many problems staying in hotels and so forth. And one thing we for, forgot to ask was, uh, uh, did you ever have any children? Oh, yes. Uh, um, and what was it like to balance work life with family life? You, you seem pretty busy. Well, I'm sure my daughter if asked would tell you that there were times that I was too busy with business. Um, I had a son who died of prostate cancer about 10 years ago. My daughter is married. Her husband is 
a manufacturer of muddy emitting diodes. He does all of his manufacturing in China now. I'm very proud of him. Um, when they were married, I summoned him the day before the wedding to my office. Summoned. <laughs> handed him a prenuptial agreement. And I said, sign it. Well, my daughter was already worth two or three million, and he wasn't worth anything. He today is worth millions, and I'm very proud of him. And do you have grandchildren and great-grandchildren? Oh, grandchildren. I have a grandson and a granddaughter. The grandson is married to a lovely gal, and they have two daughters, one, two, and the other about two months. <laughs> wow. Hands are full. Yes. Mm -hmm. His daughter is also beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, intelligent, sweet, nice. You'd love her. <laughs> now, my question is, when history is written, what, what do you want to say about you? <laughs> I don't know. Is there anything that you want to be remembered for doing, or how do you want your legacy to be? Well, actually, I don't know. The, um, a man is presently composing my obituary so that when that day comes uh, it will be what I want said <laughs> and my assistant has been after me to get that job done and John Williams who died about a year ago had the same fellow write his obituary and I guess there's Well, she's been pestering me to get it done, and I guess she's right. And Jeannie and I have recently purchased two cemetery lots. We have designed had designed the stones and so forth. Um, I age alone because I'm 40, 14 years older would indicate that I will go first before Jeannie, but you never know. And we have had the 
stone work designed and so forth so that it's what we want and not what any relatives try to dictate. And my sister, who's 12 years younger, is delighted that we're doing this. And I guess it's a smart thing to do. Well, you can call the shots. Yeah. Something you've done a lot through your life, sounds like. Well, I, I guess I ought to send you an article from the Tulsa World on my underth birthday. We, oh, we can probably we we can get it online. Oh, you can. Mm -hmm. What did you do for your hundredth? Jeannie had a dinner party for over a hundred guests. Wow! And I don't cook. <laughs> the mayor was there and said some nice things, and the um, they read a letter from signed by Barack and Michelle Obama, and I told the dinner gathering that I appreciated everything that they'd done at the dinner except the letter from the White House. <laughs> Which got a big laugh. <laughs> well did you did you ever meet Henry Bellman? If you're a Republican you probably did. Oh, I knew Henry very, very well. And, of course, I know Jim Lindhoff extremely well. And Henry didn't like milk. What? Henry didn't like milk. <laughs> I remember that something. Someone told me that, so I had to go look it up. He didn't like milk. <laughs> and you wouldn't have had your vodka martinis at, at his governor's mansion either. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> he was a teetotaler. <laughs> so do you miss train travel? Do I? Miss train travel? No. Um, I flew so much in a private airplane. Um, and train travel was always interesting, particularly with a private car. And although I think the engineer seemed to delight shaking up the last car in the train, if he could. <laughs> Well, it's quite a difference from New York City to Tulsa. Did you miss much from the big city? No, not really. No. I, 
I belonged for years to three clubs in New York and I spent a lot of time in New York. Um, I was probably there at least once or twice a month for a long time. You were just coming out of, let me get my dates right, during the Depression you were in college or you had just graduated from college? Um, I graduated from college in 1936. I guess. Did you have any memories of the depression then? Did it impact anything you were doing? Um, not really because I never locked a job when I wanted one. And my father was never out of work. I guess the only other, other question I have is, is in your lifetime, what's been the, the greatest change you've witnessed or, or you've lived through? Well, I've seen a, a lot of change. I can remember when we first had a radio in my own. And of course, I think my first flight in an airplane was in 1938 or 9. That was a DC-3. several trips to back and forth from Europe in the super fast airplane. The Concord? The Concord? Yes. I know one trip We took off from Paris about 10.30 or so in the morning and landed in New York. I transferred to our jet and actually 
I don't recall the exact time, but it was something like five or six minutes from Paris to Tulsa. <laughs> All the time change. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you could give one piece of advice to a person that wanted to live 100, what would it be? Some people are just fated to live longer. And I actually feel better than I did two or three months ago. I don't know why, but I do. Your persistence paid off. <laughs> that may be part of your secret, huh? Yes, I'm the happiest I've ever been. <laughs> well, is there anything else you want to add before we close out? I don't think so. Well, it's been quite a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>